It gives me a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. He is uh, new to us. He, uh, after this first uh, this conference, we actually um, had him come up. He's the one that is, is actually replacing Dr. Boland. Many of you already know him. Dr. Boland uh, left us, and we have. It, it is indeed an honor to introduce him. The one thing that stood out while I was reading his bio was he's an aviator, and I have the utmost respect to those guys because. I am terrified of heights, and those people who can actually conquer that, that is a great thing. We have him straight from South Carolina, and we would like to welcome you to this conference, Pastor, and I want a Texas-sized welcome here. Before he took the role as the state overseer here, he, he served as the Pacific Northwest overseer. He also served in various roles on the youth, uh, youth and Christian Education Board. He served on the church, uh, church board and the state council. He currently serves as the, uh, on the board of directors of the Pentecostal Seminary, which falls under the Church of God International. He also has 23 wonderful years serving the Lord. And I believe that itself um, is honorary because today we also see many men of God that actually have fallen. But... A man who has st stood up. I know there are several of you in our midst today who has served more than 23 years, but that itself, I think, it's worth mentioning. He is joined in the ministry by his wife, Shelly, and his wonderful daughter, Bailey. And one more time, I would like to invite Pastor Dorothy to come in and inaugurate this meeting. Amen. Thank you. God bless you, my brother. Thank you. Go right ahead. Good evening, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight, amen. amen. Our dear brother had mentioned I'd served the Lord in the role of pastor for 23 years. I've served God for 31 years, and uh, I thank God for his goodness and mercy. <laughs> what an honor it is, what a joy it is to speak tonight in this opening service of this convention, conference. I appreciate the executive committee for uh, asking me to be a part of this wonderful conference on behalf of the executive offices of Texas of the Church of God, some 200 churches, 500 ministers, 35,000 members of Texas, we welcome each of you to the great state of Texas. Our prayer is that you would have a tremendous encounter with our Father, our Heavenly Father, with the Lord and by the visitation of his spirit these next four days, that God would meet with you right here in this place, that you would leave this conference with a burning fire and passion to draw closer to God, that your families would draw closer to God. Truly, we're in the last days. If ever we needed a visitation of his power and presence, a drawing near to him, we need it today. Tonight, I'm intrigued by the theme of the conference for this week. I'm intrigued by the selection of the scripture. The theme this week is taken from the scripture, Joshua 24 and 15. Just five simple words. We will serve the Lord. What an affirmation. What a declaration. When I thought of this theme, when it was shared with me, of what you'll be discussing and challenged by for these four days, I thought no better picture, no better example than the one Jesus gave his disciples and left for us all of his disciples in John chapter 13, where Jesus was going to display and portray the purest form of being a servant of God. It's when he washed the feet of his disciples. What a beautiful picture. See, when we talk about serving the Lord, we must realize that there's not a better picture than that. That taken from the example of our Lord himself. However, in the Old Testament, there is another reference to serving God. And I want to read to you 
from the word of the Lord tonight, from Job chapter 1, verse 6. You're welcome to stand for the reading of God's word. Just as Jesus gave us a picture of servitude in the New Testament, we have a picture of a servant in the Old Testament. Job chapter 1 verse 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them. The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Now this is what I want to talk to you about just for a moment. Doeth Job fear now that word fear is interchangeable with the word serve. Does Job, doeth Job fear or doeth Job serve God for naught? What a question. That's my question tonight. Will a man serve God for nothing? You may be seated. We must understand that this question was not asked by God. This question was not even asked by Job. But this question was asked by Satan. Does Job fear God for nothing? He's asking, does Job serve God for favor? Does Job serve God for nothing? This is a question you and I need to face tonight. Will a man serve God when that man is immersed in suffering? There's possibly never been a man in history who suffered like Job. He knew the pangs of poverty. He lost all of his possessions suddenly and tragically like the crash of the world's greatest stock market. Suddenly all that he had was swept away. He lost his family too. A man can get along pretty well when the world crashes around him. If his family stands by his side, he can, he can at least make it. And he can find strength if his family is by his side. But Job not only has lost everything, he has lost his family. Job knew the pains of physical pains. And in addition to all that he lost, Job was affected with some ancient, loathsome disease as well. A disease that left him scratching and itching his miserable body until blood ran out of those sores. Think of it. From prosperity to poverty. From a wonderful family to utter loneliness. He lost it all. He even lost his health. Will a man serve God for nothing? The devil is saying to God, in effect, you take away what you give this man and he won't serve you anymore. He will no longer live for you. Sadly, with a lot of people, the devil would be right. But the scripture says that when all of this happened, that Job tore his mantle, he shaved his head, he fell on the ground, and he worshiped God. 
And all of this Job said not nor charged God foolishly. Will a man serve God when he is forsaken? When he is doubted by his friends? One of life's most blessed possessions are friends. But will a man serve God when he doesn't have a friend? Sometimes while serving God, you may have to stand alone. Daniel stood alone in the midst of a pagan nation. Noah built his ark while people laughed at him and mocked him. He stood alone. Jesus knew loneliness also. When the crowd mocked him, his disciples deserted him and they walked far behind him. Will a man serve God? Will a man serve God even when God is silent? The darkest experience is when God seems to be silent in our life. God was silent. The heavens were brass for Job. There isn't any suffering like the silence of God. The silence of God was one of the great issues at Mount Calvary. When Jesus bore our sins and he carried our sorrows, the sun hid its face. The blackest, darkest shadows of the world covered the skies at Calvary. It seemed like God himself could not even speak. Will a man serve God when God is silent? But suddenly God spoke to Job. And he didn't answer any Job's questions. He didn't explain the mystery of suffering to Job. But rather he underlined his own sovereignty as a mighty God. You know what God said to Job? He said, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you? Half the reign of Father who provided for the raven his food? Where are you? <laughs> when, when strength was given to a horse and he was clothed around his neck like thunder, where are you? Can thou dress out the Leviathan from the, from the hook? Uh, suddenly Job realized that God had to give an account to nobody because he is God. Hallelujah. It's us that have to give an account to God, not Him to us. A man mustn't ever serve God for what he gets from God. A man ought to serve God for the sake of God Himself. Serve God because you love Him. Serve God because you want to give Him your best. Serve Him in spite of the circumstances of life. One missionary watched a native as he took his children to the river. The river was infested with crocodiles. One child was crippled. One child was perfectly, perfectly healthy. It was a custom of the natives to take their children and offer them as a sacrifice to their pagan god. And that missionary watched this play out and that native took those two children, one deformed, one perfectly whole. And as he got to the riverside, he took the child that was perfectly whole and well and threw it into the river to the crocodiles. 
the missionary was disturbed and he stopped that native and asked him, since you were going to have to give up a child anyway, why didn't you just give that child that was deformed? And that native looked at that missionary and said, your God might deserve second best, but our gods do not. God deserves our best. Serve Him in spite of your circumstances. Serve Him in the midst of your trial. Serve Him in the midst of disappointment. Put your hand in God's hand and march forward. Will you serve God for nothing? We go back to chapter 1 of Job. You don't have to turn there. What most today would have done, given the news that your business has just gone bankrupt, given the news that all of your children had just been killed in a horrible accident, given the news that your house had just been destroyed by a Texas tornado, most after the shock, they would say, I've got to make funeral arrangements. I've got to call my car, my, my insurance agent. I've got to call my accountant. I've got to hire a good attorney. I've got to talk to my financial officer at the bank. I've got to begin liquidating assets to stimulate my cash flow. Most would say... I've got too much to do than to pray or to go worship God. For most that would have come later after we try to put our lives back together. But not Job. With all of his distractions, with all of his demands, his first priori priority was to put his focus on God and worship God. At this, the Bible said, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head, then he fell to the ground. As for me in my house, I will serve the Lord. May I conclude with this. You may have come to this conference with many distractions. You may have come to this conference with many demands on your life. Make your priority these few days focusing on God. Would you stand to your feet with me tonight one last time? I feel the holy presence of God in this house. It is my honor and privilege tonight as the overseer of Texas to inaugurate the 16th National Church of God, National Conference, North American Church of God, National Conference, inaugurated in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.